We are all familiar with the expression, playing with fire, when someone is recklessly doing something that could lead to dire consequences. Well, contemporaries of the events narrated in this story used a more disturbing expression, tickling a sleeping dragon. In this video, I will tell you about how and when the dragon ended up waking up. Toward the end of World War II, on the morning of August 6, 1945, the United States of America dropped the first atomic bomb on the city of Hiroshima. Three days later it was Nagasaki's turn. Little Boy and Fat Man were the names given to these two bombs, which were the first and only case in the history of a nuclear attack. It is to be hoped that Little Boy and Fat Man will firmly maintain this macabre record in the centuries to come. But perhaps not everyone knows that a third atomic bomb was ready and about to be dropped, probably on the city of Kakura. Initially, Fat Man's target which only at the last minute was diverted to Nagasaki. Japan's timely unconditional surrender on August 15 thwarted its use and so the plutonium core of this third bomb, never used, was repatriated to the Los Alamos laboratories, where it was the subject of various experiments on which, by a strange joke of the fate, it seemed to drop some kind of curse. Before introducing you to the dragon protagonist of this story, we need to understand how a nuclear reaction, nuclear fission, works. It is a process of extracting energy from mass, it consists of breaking the nucleus of an atom by hitting it with a neutron. This fission of the atom releases a large amount of energy, in the form of heat and radiation, and at the same time frees other neutrons from the shattered nuclei. If the concentration of atoms is high enough, then the neutrons, before leaving the perimeter, will hit and break other nuclei, which in turn will release other neutrons, which will hit other atoms, and so on, until a chain reaction is triggered to self-feed and maintain this nuclear reaction process over time. Uranium, more precisely one of its isotopes, uranium-235, is the element available in nature whose atoms are most suitable for this fission process. But to start a chain reaction, you need quite large amounts of it. And then there is another element, plutonium, not available in nature, but which since 1940 American physicists have managed to synthesize starting from uranium. This new element allows for greater efficiency in extracting energy from the mass. Suffice it to say that Little Boy, the bomb on Hiroshima, used 64 kilograms of uranium to produce 15 kilotons of energy, while Fat Man on Nagasaki released 21, using just over 6 kilograms of plutonium. By concentrating enough uranium and plutonium atoms, an adequate number of neutron collisions is produced which allows a threshold called critical mass to be reached, which triggers the chain reaction and releases a large amount of energy. For example, Fat Man possessed a mass of plutonium just below the critical mass, so that by causing his criticality level to rise slightly, he would have detonated the nuclear device. The amount of plutonium needed to trigger a chain reaction is just that contained in a sphere of just over 6 kilograms in weight and 9 centimeters in diameter. All the monstrous destructive energy from the bomb that flattened the city of Nagasaki was packed into a plutonium core that you could have held in the palm of your hand. And it is precisely a nucleus like this, slightly larger than a billiard ball, intended for, but fortunately never integrated with, the third atomic bomb that will be the subject of singular experiments in the Los Alamos laboratories, where the story, of which it will become protagonist, will be worth the name of Daemon Core, the Demonic Core. We have seen that the Demon Core, which arrived at Los Alamos, possessed a mass slightly less than the critical mass. And therefore, although in this state of inactivity it was not particularly threatening, it still had to be handled with the utmost respect, since any impact or event that had altered its balance could have unleashed the inferno. In 1945, just a few days after the end of the war, while Japan was still counting the dead and discovering the consequences of radiation, some researchers began experimenting on the demon core to study how much they could increase its criticality level and how close they could get to critical mass before setting off a chain reaction. An operation of a crazy danger. Yet the scientists who led it were among those already protagonists of the Manhattan Project, 
led by the United States for the study and use of nuclear weapons. No one in the world could have known better than them the risks of the game they were about to play. Richard Feynman, later Nobel Prize in Physics and part of the Manhattan Project, used the expression, tickling the tail of sleeping dragons, a phrase that was intended as a warning to colleagues to remind them of the dangers of such experiments. Increasing criticality, put simply, is about increasing the number of neutron collisions to cause more and more atoms to fission, and there are essentially three ways to do this. The most obvious is to simply add more plutonium to the nucleus to increase the density of the atoms and, consequently, the number of collisions and fissions. Or you can compress the plutonium atoms into a smaller volume to increase their density. This was the mechanism used to trigger the Nagasaki bomb, for example. The plutonium nucleus was surrounded by explosive charges of the conventional type which, once detonated, would have created a shock wave capable of compressing the plutonium and increasing the criticality of the mass, thus releasing all the energy in a fraction of a second. Of a nuclear explosion Otherwise, without varying either the volume or the quantity of plutonium, the nucleus can be surrounded by a material that reflects the neutrons, making them, instead of coming out of the perimeter in which they are confined, bounce continuously toward the inside of the nucleus, thus increasing collisions with plutonium atoms. It was precisely this third method that was practiced by the physicist Harry Daglian. It consisted of progressively surrounding the demon core with small tungsten carbide bricks, a chemical compound capable of reflecting neutrons and sending them back toward the core. The addition of each brick brought the core closer and closer to criticality. On August 21, 1945, the Geiger counters that detected the levels of radiation made it clear that we had arrived very close to the critical mass, and so Daglian and his companions made the wise decision to interrupt the experiment and to all go home. We could conclude that the team understood that they had already sufficiently teased that dragon who was sleeping in an increasingly light sleep, but this was not the case. Something strange happened in Daglian's mind as if he had been hypnotized by that silver sphere that contained within itself a power as fascinating as damned dangerous. The same night, Daglian returned to the laboratory alone to continue the experiment and try to get even closer to the critical mass, as if in his heart he wished he could meet the dragon and look him in the eye, just for an instant, although it would be the last thing he would see. In the silence of the night, he began to replace the tungsten carbide bricks around the core to bring it back to the criticality values already reached in the afternoon. Then he pushed on. The instruments clearly indicated to him that, if he continued, nothing, no one could have prevented the achievement of the critical mass and the release of an enormous amount of energy and deadly radiation. We will never know what went through the scientist's head at that moment but perhaps the fear of having gone too far made him decide to stop and pick up the last brick he had just placed on the pile. But perhaps the same fear weakened his grip and the brick fell, hitting the plutonium core. The dragon awoke from his slumber and released all his fury. The moment the brick hit the nucleus, the latter temporarily reached criticality, causing the emission of a neutron beam of incredible intensity. The sphere emitted a blue light, due to the interaction of the neutrons with the surrounding air molecules, and Daglian felt himself pierced by a strong blast of heat. The scientist immediately reacted by withdrawing the pile of tungsten bricks surrounding the sphere, thus stopping the chain reaction. But that second of exposure to the intense irradiation was enough for Daglian to contract a then unknown disease, since it did not exist in nature, and since the first cases in history were observed only a few days earlier in Japan, following the two atomic bombs. It was acute radiation syndrome. Acute radiation syndrome, neutron radiation commonly called neutron radiation, can have devastating effects on an organism, as it can damage its cells through a process known as directed ionization. Penetrating at very high speed, 
The neutron flux can strip electrons from atoms in the human body, compromising the integrity of biological molecules, including DNA. If the irradiation is relatively low, land cells can repair themselves or be replaced. But if the radiation dose is more intense and if the DNA is more seriously damaged, the cells are no longer able to repair themselves properly and genetic mutations or the onset of cancer can occur in the short or long term, depending on the degree of exposure to radiation. In the case of Daglian, who was only a few centimeters away from a highly critical plutonium nucleus, the irradiation was extremely intense and the cells of his body suffered irreversible damage. In the hours following the accident, the first symptoms began to appear. Daglian felt increasing nausea, followed by vomiting and diarrhea. Exhaustion and loss of balance made him almost unable to move. His body tissues were already starting to suffer the irreversible damage caused by the irradiation. After a few days, a brief respite crept into his condition. The first stage symptoms disappeared, and Daglian seemed to be improving. But it was only a respite, an apparent calm before the storm. In his body, the damaged cells were about to collapse. Organs began to fail one after another, bringing Daglian to an inevitable end. Nine days after the crash, Harry Daglian died at the age of 24. But the Demon Corps' curse wasn't limited to him. His trembling hand had triggered a tragic event that would also involve others, such as Robert Everly, an unsuspecting guardian who was a few meters away, in the next room, intent on reading the newspaper. He too, unaware of what was happening, would pay a heavy price later. The shadow of the demonic nucleus also stretched over Louis Sloten, Daglian's friend and colleague, who had accompanied him during those 25 painful days of agony in the hospital. Seven months later, Sloten would also die in the same hospital, assisted by the same nurse, due to the same disease. The curse seemed to have affected anyone who had anything to do with the demon core. Even Enrico Fermi, the famous scientist, had foreseen Sloten's tragic fate, warning him that he would not make it to the end of the year if he continued with his dangerous manipulations. Sloten, however, ignored the dangers and abandoned all precautions. By removing the spacers between the beryllium hemispheres, he brought the nucleus ever closer to critical mass. He manipulated the width of the slit with the blade of a screwdriver, tempting fate. It was a temerity that was difficult to comprehend. The demonic core seemed to have hypnotic power, binding scientists to its dangerous attraction. On May 21, 1946, Louis Sloten was intent on repeating the operation with his screwdriver. But this time, fate was not in his favor. At 1520, the screwdriver slipped from his hand, causing the beryllium sphere to close completely on the plutonium core. That moment marked the end for Sloten. Nuclear power reached critical mass, giving off a blue glow and a fatal dose of radiation. The dragon awoke again, enraged. Sloten immediately felt a bitter taste in his mouth and a strong burning in his left hand, which he instinctively withdrew. He dropped the upper hemisphere, promptly halting the chain reaction. Even if he could have fled the room, Sloten knew it was useless now. His life had been drastically reduced. He called his team members and gave them chalk to mark their exact location at the time of the accident. It was a precise testimony of the time that remained to him and all of them. Sloten immediately understood that his days were numbered. He had been exposed to the highest dose of neutron radiation ever received by a human being. Sloten was rushed to the hospital immediately, but despite numerous blood transfusions, his organs failed one after another. Just like Daglian, nine days after awakening the dragon, Sloten died in excruciating pain at the age of 35. The curse of the Demon Corps continued to hover over the years. Many team members experienced health problems from radiation exposure. Alvin Gay, who had been behind Sloten during the crash, suffered permanent damage but managed to survive. However, two team members later died of leukemia and anemia, both attributable to radiation. Criticality experiments performed in this way were abandoned, and a procedure was instituted involving the use of robotic machines controlled from a safe distance. 
The molten demonic core was reused for the construction of other atomic bombs. If you follow this channel, you're into science and probably don't give much credence to stories of curses or demons. However, the story of the demon core has elements of macabre curiosity. A plutonium nucleus, initially conceived as a frightening instrument of death, became the subject of experiments conducted by scientists who, despite being aware of the risks, took a path that inevitably led them to their end. The thirst for knowledge and the urgency in the atomic arms race often prevailed over prudence. I invite you to reflect on the history of the Demon Corps and to continue to be passionate about science. We'll see you in the next video.